Testing. All right, here we go. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming and, uh, and for making the time. Um, I've met a bunch of you already, but for those of you who I have not, uh, my name is Jared Parks. I'm with uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Global Innovation Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Um, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the chamber, although sometimes we're confused with a government agency, we are uh, the world's largest business association, uh, representing over three million businesses uh, from across the country and around the world of every shape and size and uh, very diverse industries. Um, the core mission of the Chamber's Global Innovation Policy Center um, really is a focus on protecting intellectual property rights, patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, um, something that I know um, is important to many of you in this room um, and an issue um, that Congressman, Congresswoman Chu um, has been such a champion for um, in Congress. Let me just start by um, thanking our event partners, the Alliance for SoCal Innovation, and the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership. Andy, Brad, thank you very much. Um, and of course, Congresswoman, thank you uh, for your time this morning. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, Becky and Linda and your staff. They've been just um, pleasures to work with. Um, I know most of the people in this room know the Congresswoman, so I won't uh, belabor the introduction. Um, but to quickly go over um, some of the Congresswoman's background, um, Represent Representative Chu was elected um, to represent the 27th District of California, which includes Pasadena and the West San Gabriel Valley in 2009. Um, she's the first Chinese American woman ever elected to Congress. Um, prior to serving in the US Congress, she served on the Board of Education of the Garvey School District, and later uh, three terms as mayor of Monterey Park. Um, as I mentioned, um, she's been one of the true champions for intellectual property rights. Um, in Congress, both on her work um, on the Judiciary Committee and now on Ways and Means, another uh, critical uh, committee for intellectual property. Um, also, uh, as a co-founder of the Creative Rights Caucus, uh, which advocates for uh, copyright protection um, for the creative industries um, in Congress. In addition to that, um, she serves in Democratic leadership on the Democrat um, Steering and Policy Committee. Um, so, Congresswoman, thank you again for your time. Uh, really looking forward to um, an open uh, back and forth discussion. And with that, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that introduction, Jared. And I appreciate the US Chamber of Commerce putting together this event, and particularly the Global Innovation Policy Center from the US Chamber of Commerce. I've worked with this uh, center over the years and thank you for being such a great partner in spreading the awareness of the importance of IP protection in Washington, D.C. And let me say that we are very, very special. I was just told that uh, this is one of only 12 seminars that they are having like this in the nation. Oh, no, really? Okay, we're the first seminar of this type. <laughs> well, Thank you for choosing Pasadena. I'm real. I really appreciate it. <laughs> but I, I believe that they're having them over the expanse of the United States. So, so uh, we're just really lucky that uh, they chose us for <laughs> the uh, Southern California seminar that they're having. Well, I am particularly enthusiastic about this issue uh, because up until last year, I was a member of the House Judiciary Committee. And I joined the Intellectual Property Subcommittee. Uh, given that my district is home to many of the creators who work in the film, music, and tech industry, the creative industries, I uh, was very eager to join it. And I quickly realized that the voices of the creators were easily drowned out by all that was going on in Washington, DC. And so that's why I founded the Bipartisan Congressional Creative Rights Caucus. I have a Republican co-chair, Doug Collins from Georgia, and together we fight for the creative uh, rights issues on Capitol Hill. We try to help members of Congress understand um, that everyday Americans depend on the creative industries, uh, and uh, so we wanted to get a cohesive group of Congress members who would take actions on issues that affect the jobs that are created by the creative industries. And so to do that, we focus on educating members and their staff 
Uh, we've brought together members of Congress to hear from songwriters who've had number one hits only to receive only cents back in profits. We've heard from photographers who told us about the losses that their business take when their works are stolen online and they just can't afford to sue in federal court. The common theme that we hear is that current law must catch up with the technological advances of today to make sure that everybody is adequately compensated for their work and that we have to have a robust copyright office to make sure that it can efficiently and effectively serve owners, users, and the American public. So for the last few years, we've explored how we can modernize our copyright laws to address the challenges that creators face in today's digital world. And so I am happy to re report that we've made some incredible strides. We've seen some results on the House side. The first issue that I took leadership on was on modernizing the Copyright Office. It's so critical for us to have a robust copyright office. Uh, our copyright industries add over a trillion dollars to our economy every year and provide jobs to over five million people. But at the center of all of that is the Copyright Office, which has proven to be an invaluable resource and so important to lawmakers, international counterparts, and all the creative industries. But the office faces um, tremendous roadblocks. Uh, for one thing, the register and all copyright employees are appointed and accountable to the Library of Congress. That was something that was established over 100 years ago. Um, and yet, the register of copyright has some very important statutory and regulatory responsibilities. It also needs very sophisticated technology that can serve the marketplace that, um, that it serves. But these funding needs clearly should be distinct from the library. The library basically wants to make all information available to the public. The Copyright Office wants to make sure that we protect the information that is out there. So the purposes are quite distinct. That's why I introduced a bipartisan bill um, with uh, Congress Member Tom Marino to create an independent copyright office in which the register would be appointed um, in a process that's confirmed by the Senate. And um, it would also modernize uh, the copyright office with regard to technology. Uh, so we ha did get a smaller bill which at least addressed this issue of the position of the register so that it's not under the Library of Congress and, and instead so that it could be its own independent appointed position that did pass the House we felt very, very good about that. So we're taking some great steps forward. The other big step forward was the Music Modernization Act. Um, the music industry uh, has pressed us for many, many years to update our music licensing laws. Um, right now, we have standards that are set from many decades ago, and it basically allows rate court judges to consider sound recording royalty rates when they're establishing performance royalty rates for songwriters. Um, but it is uh, not serving our music industry well. They can't even introduce certain kind of information at this point. Um, and so that's why the Music Modernization Act came forth. Also, this act ensures that legacy artists, artists are compensated for pre-1972 works when they're played on digital platforms, because believe it or not, they aren't compensated now. So people like Darlene Love from the past just can't make enough money and has to go around touring until well into their late 70s in order to make ends meet. So these are some of the challenges that this act um, addresses. And I was just so thrilled to see that this bill not only passed out of the House, um, but is in the Senate now and is making some progress in the Senate. So this one actually has a really good chance of uh, being signed into law. And the third issue that I've been uh, taking up uh, in a big way is the small claims court under the Copyright Office. A common theme that we hear from this smaller and individual creators is that they lack the resources to pursue infringement claims in federal court. Um, and right now, in order to uh, try to stop somebody from infringing, they have to issue these notices and, and uh, takedowns. It's um, very cumbersome. Uh, they can't go to federal court because just doing uh, a federal 
court case um, is many thousands of dollars when in, in their case the infringement could be $3,000 or less. So it doesn't make any sense. That's why I helped introduce legislation to create a small claims system that would be housed within the copyright office uh, so that smaller creators could get compensated for their work and, and the dispensation of, this, of the cases would be within the copyright office. Uh, I uh, would also say that uh, I'm on the Small Business Committee and a very exciting bill that I have now is to uh, address the Small Business Investment Companies, SBIC funds, for the, s for the startup capital uh, kinds of uh, needs that there are in the United States. Right now there's a cap on how much banks can contribute to that SBIC fund. The SBIC fund is um, a combination of funds that is put together, but the great thing is it's guaranteed by the Small Business Administration. So that's why people feel more confident in giving to it. However, banks had been limited in terms of how much they can give to it. We think the more money in that fund, the better. So I am proud to say that this bill actually passed out of the House and now is in the hands of the Senate. And I do have to say the reason that I'm not in judiciary anymore is that I got promoted to a, <laughs> to a very powerful committee, the Ways and Means Committee, um, which uh, deals with nearly all of the fiscal impacts of bills that move through Congress. And so um, I am really glad about that, but Ways and Means is absolutely fantastic, and I'm still making IP my priority. I am also so glad to see the health industries here, too, because I am on the health subcommittee, so I believe I can be very helpful to you in the future. Um, and also, I have urged U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer to protect um, copyright. Uh, and the reason that this involves me is that Ways and Means also has under its jurisdiction trade. So you, as you know, there are many, many kinds of trade negotiations going on. Uh, but uh, what we need are strong standards of copyright protection with all the different countries, including Canada and Mexico. I'm planning to reach out to him again since we are hearing that NAFTA negotiations with Mexico are on a rapid track and I will be sure to press the issue of IP protections. So as you can see, there's so much that needs to be done. Uh, I so much appreciate hearing from you, hearing straight from you in terms of what your issues are. You can be sure that I will take your words back to Washington, D.C. and work on these issues. So um, I now have the pleasure of introducing an incredible member of the City Council of Pasadena. Andy Wilson has taken such a lead in making sure that Pasadena becomes a city of innovation. And he has such incredible expertise in this area. I am just so glad he is on the City Council to um, direct us and so thank you so much for being involved in this effort, for bringing a lot of the folks together. Uh, and so if I could pass the microphone on to our incredible city council member, Andy Wilson. I didn't follow Magenta's directions, apparently. <laughs> thank you, Congressman Chu. I have to say it's always a pleasure to um, convene with you. Um, she's such a, uh, you're such a great force in Washington, and we need someone that, like you up there every day. And I appreciate your passion for small business. Um, and you know, um, for somebody who's heads down and an entrepreneur myself, it's great to have someone who's in Washington, D.C. to take time to sit with us. Those of us who are in the trenches building companies, it, it's no a mean feat. Uh, and I think it's the, the innovation of small companies that really make our, our, our country great and certainly this region great. Um, and I, th I wanted to just share a few comments just about myself. So I'm a, a named inventor on a number of patents, so this, this area is, is near and dear to me, intellectual property uh, protection, and maybe less so in copyright, more in, in the patent portfolio in the world of filing and usage. And uh, I think we hear lots of dialogue around um, doing trade with China. I'm sure that's going to be a discussion today. Um, I know a lot of companies here look at um, overseas markets and are, are, I mean, want to make sure their, their intellectual property is, is protected. Um, my, um, besides being a part-time, as I like to say, local politician, which is my side job, I do that for fun. Um, root canal is probably sometimes more fun than that. Um, 
but it is great to serve the city of Pasadena. Um, I, I do run now the Alliance for Southern California Innovation, which is a new not-for-profit um, funded by primarily Goldman Sachs and Google, uh, focused on commercialization of intellectual property in Southern California. So this is a very appropriate topic for us. Uh, our mission is to increase or kind of optimize the conditions to allow for a great through inno breakthrough innovation to occur in Southern California. Um, and most of our members are the top research universities in Southern California. So um, you may be surprised to hear those universities spend more than seven and a half billion dollars a year in Southern California um, on research and development. Um, they generate more than a thousand patents and thousands of, of disclosures. Um, so I think you know, understanding um, and valuing those portfolios and frankly commercializing them. As I tell uh, researchers, it's great to have um, a lab experiment that's really compelling, but what really matters is getting that idea into the commercial world. That's what changes lives, and that's what um, creates commercial value. So um, that's an important part of our work at the Alliance, um, but I'm thrilled to do that and thrilled to have you here. I, I did want to uh, recognize our host today. Um, so we are in the design lab, um, which is part of Supply Frame. Um, Steve Flagg, who's the CEO of Supply Frame, has been a fellow collaborator in um, the innovation world of Southern California um, for about as long as I have, about 20 years. Uh, and uh, Dan, you can correct me if I get some of the stats right, but I, um, over that period, he's turned Supply Frame into a, uh, really a global company, um, uh, off of two offices here, and um, um, their main office is just up the street uh, on Green in, in Fair Oaks, and a uh, very different vibe than, the, than what I call the, the hacker builder space, uh, pretty slick space. Um, up on the second floor of their, their building. We'll have to do an event there at another time. Um, but you know, he's built and his team have built a, a really incredible business uh, focusing on helping engineers organize knowledge to create hardware products. Um, and I think about, once again, the intellectual property that's created in the hardware world. And uh, once again, not to touch on China too much, but a lot of manufacturing occurs in, in China for physical hardware products. And I know um, people in this room who are building hardware products you know, worry about um, protection of the low proc property when it goes overseas. Um, clearly, there's a manufacturing advantage, but um, as an entrepreneur, you always uh, feel anxiety, perhaps, when you send something offshore and it has your blueprints and specs and DNA. So I, I'd love to um, have a conversation about that as well. Um, besides acknowledging um, Dan and um, Magenta for, for hosting here, this is a, an incredible space. Um, I think that this, this lab itself was an innovation experiment. Yeah. And um, I know some great companies have, have come through here um, in, in its lifetime. Um, clearly, you know, um, the company that we're gonna, I guess is demonstrating their work over here in the corner um, with Lighthouse, which is doing what? Earth, earthquake Early Response, which is something near and dear to us in California. Uh, I think we need a derivative product called um, uh, Forest Fire Early Response. Uh, it seems to be <laughs> as concerning these days as, as earthquakes, but I know um, innovations like yours make me sleep better at night. Um, so any early response warning uh, um, is, is super important. So a um, cool team, and if you get a chance to check out what they're doing. And uh, once again, um, Jan and Magenta and the supply from Gems, thanks so much for opening this space. Um, we need opportunities. This is a private, you know, funded enterprise to allow uh, entrepreneurs to turn their ideas into practice uh, and hopefully come up with something that can improve the world. So. I know in, in Southern California, we hope you guys do a great job uh, with your work at Lighthouse and um, kind of making sure we sleep safe at night. So um, thank you all. I think I'm gonna turn it, is it to q and A is, is next. Um, I don't know how we're moderating that. Oh, introductions, is that what Becky? Um, I, I've, I've learned quickly that Becky tells us what to do next, and I understand okay. we're gonna do introductions. So I'm gonna pass it to Dan since I've kind of pre-introduced him already. So here you go. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Daniel Hinch. I'm the resident engineer here at the Design Lab. Uh, I guess I'll keep this very quick. I just wanna thank everybody for coming, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about this facility. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about how companies and engineers in the region here can gain access to use the, the equipment and the tools and the resources that we have here. I'm happy to talk about that. Thank you for coming. Hi, I'm Faish Drumi. I'm the CEO of Parkian Energy. It's a Caltech spin-off trying to make batteries that your maybe Tesla car can be charged in maybe 10 minutes and can go twice the range with half the cost of the battery. And we have about 20 patents filed by Caltech and now we have formed a startup. 
Hey guys, I'm uh, Sean Gibbons. I'm the CEO of Lighthouse. We're a, a resident here at Design Lab. <clears throat> like Andy was saying, um, we're a business that's trying to essentially democratize earthquake detection and early warning for households. And uh, yeah, that's what we're doing here. Hi, Congresswoman. My name's Ryan. Um, Sean speaks so much better than I do. <laughs> I really can't add to that, but I'm, I'm very glad to be here. So we'll have a lot of questions. Thank you. Um, Robert Walker, I guess the Chief Science Officer of Lighthouse, and uh, please forward questions to Ryan. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Michael Gimbel. I am the, the founder of a local industrial venture-backed 3D printing company. Hi there, my name is Aaron Fike. I'm a founder, co-founder of six different companies in the energy sustainability space, and now I'm focusing on uh, early stage investing in those companies. Hi, my name is Steve Fiacco, and I'm a co-founder and CEO of Everex, and we are in the biotech space. We, uh, we make drugs, and so we have uh, technology that uses evolution to create drugs against uh, really challenging diseases. And so we're primarily working in oncology uh, or, or cancer and uh, have also a, a project in inflammatory disease as well. Hi, my name is Wen Dombrowski. I'm a physician and a technologist, and I'm the chief convergence officer of our company called Catalyze. We do a combination of corporate innovation consulting. We're a virtual accelerator for tech startups and also support investors. Uh, we're based locally here in Pasadena and work with companies on a national and uh, international level as well. Yes, hi, uh, Nardo Manoloto. I'm the CEO of Catalyze, and one thing I can tell you about uh, the kind of stakeholders we work with, uh, definitely a lot of researchers, uh, academia, and we hear every day uh, how uh, they want to pursue um, businesses and but are always impeded upon and have barriers related to their IP. And, uh, and then we see different models around that and be glad to ask questions and uh, share more of that later on. Thank you, Nardo. Thanks for having me here. I'm Alex Becker, uh, founder and CEO of a company called Qlist that eliminates waiting in line by letting people join a virtual mobile line from their phone and uh, hold their spot virtually. And we let them know when their turn arrives so they can show up just in time for service. And we do this for DMVs, for healthcare institutions, for colleges, education, for retail, for ports, so for truck use. Uh, we, we've saved now uh, over 140 million people more time of waiting in line than all of recorded history. Um, so. There's actually $390 mil, uh, billion dollars a year wasted by in the US GDP from people waiting in line to people waiting are not producing and they're not consuming. So, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, a lot of the things you talked about resonate very well with things that I've experienced, so I have a lot of questions for you. Hi, my name is Bill Morley. Uh, I run a consulting firm, Altrius Group in Washington, DC. Work on a lot of these trade agreements that you reference, make sure there's high IP protections in those agreements. Really exciting to hear from all the, the IP and innovation around the table. Those trade agreements matter because it supports and protects uh, that, that IP uh, that you all are uh, creating. Thank you. Morning, my name is Stephanie C. I'm CEO of Meditech Biosciences. We are an early stage biotechnology company based here in Pasadena as well and developing novel immuno-oncology drugs using uh, technology that we licensed from City of Hope down the road. And uh, I started my career as a patent attorney 30 years ago. So these are all issues that are very near and dear to my heart that I've been thinking about for a long time. So thank you. Hi, I'm Dennis Chen. I'm here from Nubra. Uh, we are the inventor, creator, and manufacturer of the sticky bra, which is bras that you can stick on with no straps and no backs. Um, I realize that we're a little bit less digital and less medical and a little bit different from everyone else here. Um, but we're mainly here to share our experiences. Um, we've, uh, the product's been around for 15 years. We've dealt with a lot of knockoffs and IP infringement issues, uh, both in China and in the US. So I'm here today to share about our experiences. All right, uh, John Waller, early stage venture capitalist here, uh, right here in Pasadena, actually focused almost exclusively um, on opportunities in Southern California, early stage uh, tech. We don't do a lot of biotech or med devices, uh, but other than that, we'll pretty much look at everything. Good morning, everybody. I'm Brad Jensen. I'm with the San Gabriel Valley Economic Partnership. We're a regional economic development corporation that's 
been here in the San Gabriel Valley for 26 years, and we try to promote economic development uh, here in the region. Thank you. Great. And with that, um, let's open it to Q&A. I know many of you said you had some questions for the congresswoman. I don't, there we go. Um, okay, so, so I'll be quick. The, uh, my focus is less on IP protection and more what it takes to generate new startup companies, both as my experience as an engineer and now an investor. Um, I was invited to an event somewhat similar to this 10 years ago with Adam Schiff, and I'll tell you what I told him back then, which is I personally am strongly in support of single payer healthcare. Decoupling healthcare from employment, it was, was the biggest barrier for me to start my own company. Uh, particularly in the energy space, people who are starting companies are less likely to be 21-year-old dorm residents, but are more likely to be people who have something to lose if they lose their health care. Um, there's a secondary effect that health care costs were a, a material part of my expenses, and I'd be happy as an entrepreneur to not have them on my balance sheet. But for my investor, I want more people to be able to leave their jobs and start companies and Truth be told, with healthcare being coupled with employment, basically, that's um, healthcare is always brought up as we're a wealthy country, this is a moral right. It's never brought up as an engine for economic growth. But I believe that point is getting lost in the discussion. It's a huge engine for economic growth that people have mobility and freedom to do so. Next. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, I, I have three questions, one of each tied to each of the three things you talked about, and so I was really excited to hear about the work you've been doing. Uh, I did not know about it, and it's, I think, extremely uh, relevant. Th the first one ties to the SBA work you talked about. So we are, so I got my PhD from Caltech, and I started this company, and so, and we're creating a lot of uh, jobs here in Pasadena and, and elsewhere. Um, and so we applied for an SBA loan, thinking that we'd be the uh, perfect candidate for it, or, or at least kind of a, a target. And we were told, no, you don't have a lot of money, <laughs> not a lot of liquidity, um, and you plan on using all that money, you have a lot of burn, and therefore you're not eligible. <laughs> and that sounded very oxymoronic. I, you'd think that you'd want to lend to companies that don't have a lot of money and that are going to use it and burn it uh, to create, to invest in, in jobs. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to know, you know, what can be done uh, to address that? Could you tell me what kind of loan it was that you applied for? It was an SBA loan. Uh, well, there's seven uh, A, five hundred four, uh, SBICs. I'd, I'd have to check with my CFO to have the specifics, but if if you have contact info, I'd be happy to get back to you with that. Okay, so um, no, I'd be very very interested because what I really want to know uh, is how the SBA loan process is working for our small businesses. Uh, actually. Uh, my reason for me being on the small business committee is because I want to make sure that small businesses have access to these loans, and the small business committee has oversight over the small business administration. So that's why I'm particularly interested in how these things are working. Um, but uh, yeah, they they have a 7A loan, which provides the most flexibility for what you can use it for. They have 504 loans, which have to do with real estate. And in fact, I introduced a, a bill which said that you could. Uh, use those real estate loans for refinancing. And then there's these SBIC loans that, uh, uh, that are uh, the investment type of loans for startups that, um, that, that were, were, that where I have this bill that, that lifted the cap on how much banks could contribute to it. And then there's also SBIR, which, the, um, which is the SBA-backed program for getting companies to start uh, in a three-phase process uh, in which they could uh, bring in uh, an idea, an invention, and uh, first get up the get the money to develop it, then get into a second phase to stabilize it, and then get to the third phase, which is to commercialize it. So, so maybe you know we could talk in terms of like what happened exactly with with your loan, and does that indicate a problem? Thank you. I would love that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, should, you, should I give it to Tom and then we'll come back to my, my questions, my other questions? Hi. Um, 
I'm Wen. I, I have a question about IP protection and technology. Those were the themes you mentioned earlier. So Catalyze, we work a lot with AI and data or data oriented startups. And I had three questions. I'm not necessarily looking for answers at this table, but um, one of them is, you know, like what is the IP protection for software? I know there are some, you know, pre-existing rules and in cases related to it, but as software becomes more and more iterative, it's constantly changing, it's constantly evolving, and it's easy to copy, what are ways to protect the initial designs and the subsequent designs of the software? And the second question is, what about IP protection rights for data sets? Whether that's data that's collected by consumer products or data that's collected by enterprise products, as and then also the subset of healthcare data, like who owns the data and who has the right to license it, reuse it, reshare it, modify it, and um, and then the third point is just you know as with technology it's very different than um, just uh, non electronic non electronic hardware design because it is constantly evolving and iterating and so even if you are able to say that this particular architecture at this point in time is you know my design or that that person's design how do you protect it as it evolves and iterates. So my concern is regarding what you mentioned regarding protection of IP. So we started working on advanced batteries 2008 at Caltech. I got my PhD there. I founded an advanced battery lab after I got my PhD. I was the principal investigator, all of that. And Caltech has spent $1 million about to file IP on this. And now we have a startup. But I don't think the IP itself, also like $1 million is spent, is enough. Because if there is, a, there is an IP litigation with a large company, there is a very low chance that any startup with any revenue can even go to the court. And we as startups in the tech industry, like we can be the next GE, Amazon, Google, so we can create a lot of wealth. But these large companies, they don't see that much of a downside. I have seen friends of mine, they have companies, they go to the lawsuit, they run out of money, the lawsuit is over. The startup doesn't have anything else. One thing that I think can be done is that if, like maybe Congress can have some laws in terms of what happens when someone goes to lawsuits, when there's a startup and a large company. The problem I see is that for startups without any revenue, the courts do not know how to, even if we go and we win, the courts don't know how to define the damage. Because the damage right now in, this, in the law is based on lost profit. But imagine like Google or Amazon early days, like they didn't have any lost profit if someone had gone into their space and was stealing their ideas. So it would be much better if like the law was maybe well defined, I don't know how, but I'm willing to share my experience with your team, that how like a startup without any revenue but with huge potential can see that there is a benefit in defending what they have rather than just giving up and trying something else. It's, it's, it's actually slightly more insidious. Once you're uh, embroiled in a lawsuit, it's very difficult to raise money. A company that I was involved with was, um, the founders left and they were sued by their prior, em, prior employer. Uh, the prior employer was, um, realized that by dragging out the lawsuit, the company would have no means of raising further capital, and they had enough money to um, win by attrition. And uh, so, you, you know, having no resources to fight a lawsuit and no ability to raise money to continue fighting a lawsuit, the, the, the facts of the case became moot. It really came down to the reality of how the legal system was structured. I don't know what the solution is for that, but that was very frustrating to be involved with. In the uh, course of the history of Qulis, we've had two experiences that, that uh, relate to this. Um, so the first one was when we were really, really tiny and uh, starting off, um, a foreign company that got threatened by us and said th they made these coaster pagers that people pay a hundred bucks for to skip the lines of theme parks. So, you know, and just a few people get to do it and everybody stands in line. And when we started talking to theme parks and 
you know, Disney or Universal were telling this other big company, hey, this looks like this is a much better technology from this Pasadena-based company. They f went and they bought a patent that was really kind of irrelevant to us. They s turned around and immediately sued us. And then I met with their CEO and he said, yeah, I wanted to call your attention because I want to buy your company. And I said, bad way to call our attention. But the, but the point is, <laughs> you know, it was, <laughs> it was very expensive for us as a very young startup to have to deal with this. And, you know, by, by virtue of my hard-headedness, we ended up, you know, fighting it on and, and eventually winning a, a very good settlement. Um, but it still actually excluded us from the theme park space for years, you know, un, uh, up, to, up to today. And so only later this year will we finally be able to bring this innovation that we invented 12 years ago to theme parks because that's all they cared about was protecting their, their little turf. Uh, so having a, I think there's a couple of things that, that can help them from, from a legislation point of view. One is the loser has to pay for the cost of litigation. It is just too easy and too inexpensive for a company to just sue anybody, whether they're right or not, even if they know they're not right. Well, like we even asked them, what are we infringing here? And they couldn't even answer. They didn't even try. They knew that we weren't, but they didn't care, right? Because they can sue. And w but if the law was that the loser pays, then we, you know, we could have perhaps borrowed against it and so on. So I think that's the first thing. And the second one ties to what you were, you, it sounds like you've already been doing work on, which is to make these things more affordable on both sides, right? So as we grew, we started getting these big contracts with DMVs uh, for us. And then we had a foreign company again uh, from the Middle East come and say, we'll copy what Kios was doing and we'll give you a, a version of that uh, for cheaper. So one of the states chose to go with it and, and do it. And so it's the government itself, it's taxpayer money that's funding this, this ripoff. The system worked horribly, it's, it's been down, it doesn't work, but the, you know, but the RFP was lost and, and it was done. So having a, an affordable way for a company that's still relatively young to be able to fight back on that uh, without incurring you know, millions in, in patent litigation costs would be really, really helpful. I guess first off, was there anything you wanted to answer before we keep <laughs> throwing more <laughs> stuff at you? I do want to say that the kinds of stories you're telling sound very familiar to me because uh, there was uh, uh, a, an uproar about the kind of litigation that's going on in this country in which there are patent trolls. And this patent troll industry has gotten very, very huge. Um, it's, it's gotten so out of control that, yes, you could be sued, and the person who's suing you doesn't even have to indicate what they're suing you on. So even just knowing what they are suing you on would be a great step forward. Not only that, there are certain courts, uh, there was a court in, what, Texas, uh, where it was easy to get the patent, for the patent trolls to get their way. And uh, so, so there was some movement to, to try to stop all these cases from just being taken to Texas. Um, anyway, we had this uh, patent bill that was going through which tried to do all kinds of reforms in this arena, uh, but um, we, we had some problems on the Senate side and so it, it, was, it was stopped. I think it would have taken a great step forward, but uh, there were some many provisions there that were very excellent. Uh, that uh, could have solved a lot of these problems. But, but I, I want to hear your stories because what uh, is interesting to me is how this impacts startups and the economy. And you're right. Uh, you know, I, I didn't think of this as an issue that relates to how well our economy is doing. So I'm going to take um, maybe an unpopular stance here. Um, and granted, there's other sides to the stories and you talked about the patent trolls, but for young entrepreneurs and startups and small companies, sometimes these patent trolls, as they're called, are the only option. I, before I became a VC, I was an entrepreneur a couple of times and we had some very large uh, tech companies infringing on our patents. And as a small company, we had no way to defend against that. Our business was completely torpedoing because of these large companies just blatantly infringing and they didn't care because they knew we couldn't compete. So the only sword we ever had was to talk to patent trolls and that gets their attention and we eventually did a licensing deal and it all worked out fine. But without those people, they are, again, they, they, they may not have a great reputation and there's some downsides to them, but as a small entrepreneurial startup, they're the only option for small guys like these startups that we're talking about. 
All right, and but, I have some. Oh. But in your case, if they were doing it for a legitimate reason. Right. I mean, you know that there are patent trolls that are not doing it for a legitimate reason. Exactly, yeah. So um, actually what you mentioned touches on what I had to share. Um, so uh, I believe it was in 2014 to address the issue of patent trolls. It was the um, AIA, American Innovation Invents, American Invents Act, exactly. Yeah. And the establishment of the PTAB, which is the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, I believe. That's right. So, um, I was at a conference a couple months ago uh, at the USPTO for like an inventors association newly formed across America to deal uh, specifically with the ramifications that the PTAB have caused basically. So as we know like the AIA was originally created to counter patent trolls um, to let uh, and the PTAB was established to basically take a look at patents and see are they valid should they be invalidated do these uh, corporations have a right to have all this intellectual property. And that's well and good, but uh, since 2014, the side effect has been that for a lot of smaller companies, what's happened is that the PTAB, anyone who wants to infringe on your patent, they just roll up and they'll say, I wanna move to invalidate your patent. And as an, as an owner of intellectual property, you're pretty much obligated to go before the PTAB and try to defend your patent that was registered and reviewed by uh, patent attorneys very, very vigorously by the USPTO. They spend hundreds of hours doing that and they basically just say, no, it's done, it's gone. You might have been using it for five years. You might have been using it for, in our case, seven. Um, and especially, I think this is especially pertinent for everyone here who's in the uh, software space um, in the digital space, the I believe the invalidation rate with the PTAB is somewhere around over 60%. Um, so that's saying like 60% of all cases that's brought before the PTAB, they walk out and the IP owner is left with basically nothing. Like everything that they invested their money, they paid tens of thousands of dollars in fees, registration, all that stuff, gone and accounts for nothing. All the time that they spend research and development um, and they you know, made their technology public going on record to register for the patent. Um, anyways, so the point is, in the current environment, it is actually stacking the cards against owners of intellectual property. It's easier for someone who is trying to infringe to just move to invalidate. And here's the other thing. Um, in the current system right now, whoever sues, uh, moves to invalidate or uh, you're trying to sue them and they're violating your IP, right now, you go to their state, not the owner of the IP state. So I think that would be one practical change that could you know, help owners of legitimate IP is to make it so that you could try cases in the state that the patent owner chooses. So instead of having to run to five different states uh, for five different lawsuits, you could just do it all at home. Um, loser pays is also a huge part of it to ensure that, you know, it's, uh, that, people, that there is a consequence for people who are violating intellectual property. Because right now, as things are, it's not always economically viable for smaller companies or even mid-sized companies to try to enforce the patents that they've already spent money to have. Um, so I'll, I'll, that's enough for now, yeah. I, I would add to that. Um, so I think uh, if you think about criminal justice, right, we have public taxpayer money funding the prosecution of criminal case because it's in the interest of society at large to have criminals uh, prosecuted. And yet for all of these cases that harm you know, the, the economy at large and prevent you know, millions and millions of jobs being created because these startups you know, that, that get squashed by big companies don't, don't generate jobs if, if they can't defend their IP. There is no f government institution that goes out and prosecutes those basic cases. It's, it's, you know, it's, the, it's up to the startup to defend them. So if there was a possibility of creating an office that actually looks after domestic IP and prosecutes those cases, that would provide an, an alternative, affordable way um, for, for these startups to defend themselves. So that's one idea I wanted to introduce. The other one is I wanted to tie to something that Wen raised. So she asked about um, IP protection for software. I'm, 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 I'm the inventor of many, many patents issued and many more pending, a lot of them in software. And, and there's been a real shift in the patent office with software, right, where uh, patents used to be granted for software and it's getting harder and harder to get uh, patents uh, for software for methods. If you don't have a hardware piece, sometimes the, you know, the, the, the attorneys don't even want to do it uh, if, they're, if they're conscientious because they, they, these cases are getting rejected. And I think there's, there's room for a middle ground in between the traditional patent for 20 years for a hardware invention like Ad Alva Edison's light bulb 
and the Copyright Infringement Act, which protects just the exact identical copy but doesn't really help for software if they just tweak a little bit. Right? What if there was a middle ground that gave you five or 10 years, right? You don't, in, in a fast moving world of today, you don't need 20 years of protection. But you do need something. The whole reason I came from Argentina to the US was bec you know, and to, to go to college at MIT and then to get my PhD at Caltech was because the US had this very strong investment in R&D. And the reason there's a strong investment in R&D here is because there's protection for people who invest in it so they get their money back. And so protecting it is really key to, to, to maintaining the superiority of, of the US in this. And I think there's, it hasn't been modernized in too many years. There, there's room for a middle system that protects software, maybe not for 20 years, um, in, a, in a way that's somewhere in between copyright and patents. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Do you, you want to answer that question first? or? <laughs> I'm just interested in your feedback there. Um, I, so, uh, no, I'd just like to hear your feedback. Um, one, one thing that really interested me, Congresswoman, was um, th this concept of decoupling the, the Library of Congress from um, our copyright. Uh, and I found that interesting because essentially we have the same problem with the USPTO, where 100% of the USPTO is user funded. So, you know, basically we're putting in patents and then we have to pay the USPTO obnoxious fees. And then the USPTO is then incentivized to basically kick back all of our applications and make the process take two or three years. Um, so the result of that is really uh, the patent process is stifled for a considerably long time and costs an obnoxiously large amount of money because the USPTO is incentivized to basically make the process as difficult as possible. Uh, so one thing that I think would be hugely beneficial would basically be doing the, the same thing that you already seem to have uh, really pushed through of uh, decoupling uh, our copyright from the Library of Congress uh, and basically getting rid of that same kind of conflict of interest um, within the, the system of the rest of intellectual property. Can you hear me? There we are. Um, I, I did have a different question, but I want to address the loser pays. That actually fear, I, I have a lot of fear about that. Um, PTAB was addressed because came about because of patent trolls. Uh, a loser pay technology or, or, or notion is going to have its own downsides as well. And I fear that the loser pay is going to see dream teams of attorneys. And when you have one very large, rich company that just wants to knock out a small company like anyone here, um, they're the ones who are going to be able to hire all of the attorneys. And when you go to a small claims court or any other court, Everybody believes that they're in the right. They're going to win. And the loser pay is really going to hurt us even more. Um, I think so because I can't afford a dream team. Um, Lighthouse is very fortunate. We've won a lot of grants. Uh, we have our choice. We had our choice of IP attorneys. We have a very nice high power IP attorney right now. And one of our grants, the entire thing is going to go to them. And I understand that in order to be a player in the, in the hardware industry or software industry, a lot of our money has to go to these attorneys. Um, I really fear that it's going to hurt us even more if we have a loser pays. There will be uh, um, lawsuits that we're going to be involved with. Um, it's just an inescapable part of life and work. Um, I love the notion where it comes from, but I think that of all ideas that come about, I, I can come up with so many notions of loopholes in that. And I also agree because if we like Samsung is working on advanced batteries, Panasonic is, and if they use our technology that we have spent so much money and time, and we go to the court, they can hire like a team of uh, best attorneys on this planet, and. For us, we don't have the money to even go to the lawsuit even now. If we think about, oh, we have to pay for their attorneys too, then we, of course we just go like do something totally different. I think one uh, thing that could be done is that for the court or for the USPTO, because USPTO is also very slow, courts are also slow, is that if they raise the prices and costs for the large companies by a factor of 10, like, why should I pay the same amount of money if I go to the court as Samsung does? 
or for USPTO, like the difference is very small. USPTO doesn't have enough people, so why can't they just charge these large companies 10 times more? And I see that these large companies every year, they file 100 patents on, a on one subject without having any material. They just, they, for them, filing a patent is so like low cost, uh, unlike uh, startups, that even if they have some idea about using something with something else, they just file a patent because then later they can use that against any, pat uh, like any patent protection we as uh, startups can have. So it would be, I guess, uh, essential to charge them a lot more. So to prevent them from like, filing like, not real patents, and also at US USPTO, and also in the court system, also like charging them a lot more in the court fees when they go and they want to either defend or attack anyone's IP. Uh, Congressman Chu, I had a question. I know you're, you're very involved in the Small Business Administration, and I think um, having a small business is different than having a tech business. I think I'm guessing with Alex's experience in getting um, small business funding, those tend to make sense when you're building, you know, you're, let's say you're building a construction business and you're buying hardware and building facilities. And these companies, R&D, is kind of an intangible, and, and it's harder to access. It's almost venture capital driven. And I imagine when you have bank loans, it's, it's a kind of an apples and oranges type of problem. And I guess my question to you, um, Congresswoman Chu, is in, in the government, do, is there good delineation between the invention-driven IP universe in the world of small businesses. And small businesses are a very important part of our, our, our economy, but they work very differently than the businesses we're talking about here today. So I think it would be helpful for us to understand and make sure in your mind that you understand that distinction, because I think the advocacy and the policy making needs to be distinct, because the challenges are different. Um, could you maybe talk to that for a second so we understand kind of where, where to go with our questions? Because they do get mixed up a lot. Yeah, uh, and, and um, that's why uh, I was differentiating, be, you know, when you were bringing up the SBA um, uh, loan process, uh, between the 7A and the 504, which, which are for the types of traditional companies that, that you're talking about, versus the SBIC and the SBIR. Uh, SBIC being the small business investment companies, which is really for startups and uh, is, is really kind of a uni unique model because it takes private money uh, from venture capitalists and banks and, and so forth and groups it all together and then there's a guarantee by the SBA, the SBIR process, which is um, taking a, uh, a startup through these three different levels so that they can become an established company. So there is, there is that kind of differentiation um, there, but, you know, I just want to see that it works for everybody. So, um, two things. First off, uh, about a year and a half ago, I had been commissioned by a company on the west side here in Los Angeles uh, to build a device in order to solve a problem for them, and it was a mechanical device uh, designed to go out into the field, and there was nothing that existed in order to solve the problem that they had. I designed it, built it, manufactured it, fabricated it, delivered it for them, worked perfectly, and I have sort of in the back of my mind always thought, you know, I, it, this is in fact a novel thing. It's not necessarily commercially viable, but it's the sort of thing that I should have a patent for. And not one comment that I've heard today has encouraged me to think that this is something that I should go do. It just sounds like it would be a, just a financial sinkhole in order to not have any guarantee of any kind of protection or even get a patent at the end of it. Um, so that's the downside. Uh, on the positive side, I, I just wanted to point out that one of the first groups that we fostered here at the lab, a company called Perceptoscope, just got their SBIR grant. And because of that funding, we're able to push through the final steps to be able to get the intellectual property protection on a patent for the novel design that they have within uh, the engineering that they had done. So, you know, while I'm on one side of that divide thinking, well, I don't think this is ever going to be anything I should actively ever pursue, I do see the positives and that on occasion it actually does manage to work in the way that we all hope it does. So, Hello? 
I just wanted to share a scenario that we often see. So we often go to academic and industry conferences, and we see a lot of engineers and other people present their academic, their academic work, and we also see a lot of publications related to that. But they're not necessarily mindful of, oh, this is something that you know, YouTube or some startup could commercialize. So um, I'm wondering, is there a way to protect the essentially very naive uh, academic grad students and postdocs? And then the second related issue is that um, we've been told that, you know, when when researchers who are maybe mindful about their, their intellectual property, when they submit grant applications like to the NIH, they're worried that that information is going to be either published uh, in terms of um, being publicly accessible or go into private reviewers' hands. And oftentimes reviewers are within the same field and discipline and could, could essentially copy and plagiarize what they've done. Yeah, yeah, just to add on to that and also to Dan's point. So we have, uh, we have a lot of maker. So I think we need to redefine what a creator is, right? Because right now the definition that I heard from you was all about you know, music and uh, entertainment and things like that. But the creator community, maker spaces in the area of healthcare and biotech where you create biomarkers, that those are all different kind of creation. We need to figure out how to protect the, these creators. L let me give you multiple examples of what happens with like a Dan example, right? So uh, a lot of consulting firms and design firms, basically they get uh, work for hire. Until the work for hire contract happens, they're creating IP to show that they're capable of doing these kind of things, and they have no protection. So you have an entire services industry that creates IP that has no protection at all, and they often get um, uh, they often get uh, either uh, their ideas stolen, and then all of a sudden, you're like, okay, well, how do I defend myself against that, right? So something like that. So I think a redefinition of what a creator is within all the different kinds of industry plus protection for people that creates these IP as a means of uh, a living. I just want to make sure, because we have to, we'll have to close up soon, that anybody who wanted to say something that hasn't been able to say something so far, uh, just give that opportunity to anybody. Okay, so maybe Brad. I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to ask kind of a I'm going to roll a grenade on the floor and we'll see what happens. <laughs> but my question is, is that, you know, here we are at a group and we've heard a lot of very good quality ideas about substantive policy changes that could improve the environment uh, for people who are engaged in these type of innovative businesses. And what I hear, and I've been dealing here with a lot of local companies in San Gabriel Valley who are heavily engaged in trade overseas. And they're very concerned about the tariffs and things about potential trade war, and they've expressed a lot of frustration uh, with Congress, because they believe Congress has the power to dis determine this policy. Uh, my question is that this is, the ideas that we're hearing are not partisan, right? You can see that these are harming American workers, these are preventing growth of American companies, uh, and this is something that, you know, if there were greater protections, these companies could grow, could add more workers, high paying, good quality jobs uh, here in the San Gabriel Valley. Do you feel like there's a, a chance of working across the aisle in Congress to say, look, for the benefit of the country, for the good of the country, this is something that we need to do to pass a law that would make substantive improvements to the existing environment for these startup and innovative companies? So that's just a small question putting it out there. <laughs> but, uh, but I do want to say that actually it is in the copyright and patent space where we've had more bipartisan work. Because you're right, it isn't just a Democrat or Republican issue. This is something that benefits the businesses. So the America Invents Act, my, my various bills also related to the creative industries, r actually are, are much more bipartisan than you would ever think. Um, and. Uh, uh, so I see actually more success there than, than in other arenas. That is a, a great way to close out this conversation. I have the unfortunate task of uh, reigning on the parade here. Um, I know the Congresswoman has a, a busy day ahead, uh, but let me just echo that. Um, from my work at the U.S. Chamber, one of my favorite things about working on IP is the fact that it, it's, it's not a partisan issue. It's a complex issue sometimes, but it's not a partisan issue. It's really about jobs, competitiveness, innovation, creativity. 
Um, you know, we, uh, we did a study that shows 45 million jobs across the United States depend on IP, 7.7 .7 million here in a state like California. So hard to overstate its importance to the economy, to businesses, to innovators like yourselves um, in the room. Um, so thank you all for your time today. I think, um, you know, these are topics that we could discuss for much more than an hour. And so I hope uh, we can keep the conversation going. I know the Congresswoman does um, as well. But really, um, you know, I, th I think all of us can agree on the importance of IP. Sometimes the policy solutions are complex, which is why it's so important to have conversations like this, um, you know, for policymakers in Washington and for people like me at the U.S. Chamber, you know, we're endeavoring to be the voice of the business community on IP. And sometimes it's hard to do that sitting in an office in Washington. So it's a really valuable thing, I think, for all of us to, to hear um, all of your individual voices. Um, and I really hope it's something um, that we can keep uh, talking about going forward. Um, I have cards for everyone and um, would love to continue the conversation. Um, thank you again to all of our hosts today. Um, and of course, Congresswoman Chu, thank you so much for your time and all of your work on IP. Thank you.